wanna sound like a professional? The Merch Studio should be your next stop. A private, intimate environment by invite only. Our engineer has years of experience mastering mix downs, production, and beats. Available all in our one stop shop of entertainment. Merch Studios, let us help you sound the best, be the best, and beat the rest. Together at Merge Studios. Hey, yo, what's good? Welcome. To Ralph Reads, brought to you by T U R N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend, tell a friend, tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's episode of Ralph Reads, we venture through the mind of the young protagonist in Sister Soldiers, Midnight, and the Meaning of Love. This is Volume 2 of Book 1, the second go-round of what's begun. Without further ado or governance, let the reading commence. Chapter 6 Nightfall came. The New York City lights lit the way for many late-working professionals to escape. Satisfied at how my exit plan was shaping up, I shot over to the Bronx and have a meet-up with Mr. Ghazali. He had been Uma Design's best customer. He was Muslim and Sudanese, head of the only Sudanese family besides ourselves that we had come to know in America. The owner of a taxi business, he had enough confidence in Uma's skills to hire her to be the seamstress for his nephew's elaborate Sudanese wedding. After viewing and observing Uma's detailed understanding of Sudanese culture, Mr. Ghazali hired her to be the wedding planner for the entire event. The $10,000 that we earned from that one wedding is what put us over the top so that we could finally buy a small house in an effort to move out of the Brooklyn projects. He had hired us once, been kind to my mother and family, and paid his debts on time. Now I was going to hire him to do some simple but important work for me. When I arrived in the Bronx, I phoned his house from the train station. His phone rang five times, and just as I was about to hang up, I heard the voice of his daughter, Sudana. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu responded. May I speak with your father, please? You sound tired, Sudana said, surprisingly recognizing my voice. But I should not have been surprised. She was a girl who had kept her eyes on me even when I was not noticing her. While I was working on her family's wedding, I stashed one of my guns at the wedding venue. She saw me when I was sure no one was looking. She laid back, waited, and removed the gun from a tall ceramic vase where I had hidden it. She gift-wrapped it in a colorful box with a bow as though it were a wedding gift. She handed it to me so politely and casually after the wedding ended. 
Such a beautiful Sudanese teenage girl who I had met after Akemi had already tiptoed into my heart and made herself at home. My father isn't in right now, she said regretfully. I'm here in the Bronx. I was trying to meet up with him, I said, thinking aloud. Where? Down the block. Train station. Hold on, let me call him because he really should be on his way home, she said eagerly. I heard her calling her father on what I guessed was another phone line. My father said you should come on over to our house. He'll meet you here. Or your brother's home, I followed up. No, she responded. I paused. If none of the men of her house were home, it was not proper for me to enter their house. This is the Islamic Sudanese way. I'm only five minutes away. It sounds like your father will need some more time. So I'll wait and come by a little later, I told her. You are so good, she said softly. But my father has given his permission, and you can sit here in his office. Although no one else is home, my mother and sisters and brothers and father will all be here very soon. My father would not be happy if I left you standing around and waiting in the Bronx. So please come by. Is I can meet with you? She asked. I appreciated the way she always welcomed knocking me, even though I could feel her attraction to me. Sudana was always more graceful than envious, unlike the American girls who fight to crush the competition with their tongues and fists and feet. Akemi is not with me right now, I answered. Oh. Thank you, Sudana. I'm coming through. I hung up. It was a warm night on the hot blocks of the BX. I maneuvered around tight streets where cars were double-parked for as far as my eyes could see. Some men sat on stoops and others sat on porches. Some men repaired cars while others rushed toward their homes. The ice cream truck, Mr. Softy, played his familiar jingle tune loud enough to rattle the hood and call out the hood rats. When I arrived at the only house on the block with a high fence, I stopped out front. I pushed the gate, but it was locked, like I knew it would be. It's you, Sedana's voice asked. It's me. I heard the lock click twice, and the fence opened only enough to let me in. I stepped inside and looked once before lowering my gaze away from Sudana's eyes. Come in, she smiled. I locked the fence behind me and followed her in. I didn't have to look directly at her. Easily, I could just be guided by her scent. Sudanese girls who know and live our traditions wear the most exotic and alluring perfumes. Not the same kind that you buy from the department store. They were handmade ones from centuries ago that merge with each person's personal chemistry and give her an unforgettable and unique identity. A woman's smell mixed with the perfumes that we call karma in our Sudanese language has always been unforgettable to me. I easily understood why we, as Muslim men, separate ourselves from the presence of women who are not ours. It is the subtle things that a woman does or wears that makes any man aroused if he is allowed to come too close. And every man in the world of any religion or no religion at all knows that he is or can be or will become attracted to many, many women if he is allowed to smell and come in close. Inside, I removed my Nikes. She bent to remove her sandals. I stopped myself from glancing at her feet. The inside of the house smelled like cinnamon. Sudana was cooking something, perhaps the meal for her entire family. We walked through the living room where her school textbook was wide open on the floor along with a few notebooks, pencils, and a pen. 
In a small side room with a messy desk, a telephone, and a few file cabinets, papers, and folders, a well-used soccer ball, and a soiled old pair of sneakers, she invited me to sit down on a clean cloth couch. I sank in like I was a member of their family, sitting in the same exact spot where any of her brothers had sat repeatedly. Wait a minute, please, she said, leaving the room swiftly and leaving her sweet scent behind her. Thoughts of the past three days of my life raced through my mind. Early Saturday morning was the last time that I had seen my wife's beautiful face and seductive eyes and felt her deep feeling emotions. By Saturday night she was gone. I had spent all day Sunday searching for her and Sunday night sitting with Uma being moved across continents by her true storytelling which caused me to revisit powerful memories of our Sudanese estate, my phenomenal father and our relatives, friends and people. My heart became too heavy for my chest. I made this for you, Sudana said, reappearing and carrying a tray and setting it on the desktop. The aroma of the food and her scent revived me. From the corner of my eye, I watched her pull out a metal tray with a stand, open it up, and set on it a dish of stew with a cup of tea and a cedar. You seem like the kind who won't stop to feed yourself unless someone reminds you. She smiled and turned to leave, but then stopped and added, And when you feel tired, you really should go to sleep. I looked in the ceramic teacup at the unfamiliar way she had placed three tiny yellow flowers in my tea. They rested lightly on top of the hot liquid. If I'd had the energy, I probably would have said, No, that's okay. I'm not hungry. I'll wait till later to eat. But Sudana was right. I was hungry and had forgotten to eat so far for the whole day. She stepped out, then walked right back in, carrying a warm cloth, the steam still rising up from it. She came up to me and took my right hand, wiping each finger clean, then turned my palm over and began wiping it with the warm cloth. It felt soothing and the cloth smelled like lemon. I took the cloth from her hand and then used it to clean my other hand for obvious reasons. Shukran, I said to her, meaning thank you in Arabic. Enjoy, was all she said, and she turned and left as she was supposed to. I whispered over the food, Allah, then took some spoonfuls of the stew. It tasted good and was seasoned well. I couldn't help comparing it to my Uma's food, which is always superior. The Sudanese acida bread was hot the way I liked it. I dipped it in the stew and ate it moist. I gulped the tea and it entered my body and began calming everything down. Now you look a little better. Sudana had returned as I finished. I mean, you're always so handsome, but you seem too tired today. The fabric of her black gobe concealed her flesh and hid her figure. Her hijab covered her hair, which I had never seen. She was not wearing nika, so her pretty face, flawless skin, smooth as satin, bearing one black beauty mark which gently rested over the right side of her lip, stood out more. I avoided those hazel eyes of hers, which tended to change colors like an African wildcat. Unexpectedly, she walked up close, stood over me where I was seated, and then placed two fingers on the top of my head. She pressed. It was a peaceful feeling, this sleep, like how a body rests when it feels at home and in a safe place. But I was not at home. Myself woke myself up. Now the lights in the office were dimmed. The food tray, cloth, and dishes had been removed. I leaned forward and stretched out my legs. I ran my hand over my Caesar haircut, remembering how Sudana had touched my head. It was the last thing I felt before slipping away.
I leapt up to my feet with disbelief at my own sloppiness. How could I allow myself to fall asleep in another man's home? I knew I was responsible for the mistake, but I also knew that Sudana had worked some of her Sudanese female charms and tricks on me. How could I be mad at her when I knew she did it for my own good? I couldn't be, so I stayed tight at myself. In their bathroom, I threw ice cold water onto my face and rinsed out my mouth and washed my hands. When I stepped out into the hall, I could hear the sounds of a full house out in their living room. When I entered the living room, all the female family members began laughing, beginning with the mother. Meanwhile, Mr. Ghazali and both of his sons suddenly stood up from their seats. A smile forced its way across my face. I was embarrassed. My bad. Salam alaikum, Mr. Ghazali and family. It's really okay, Mr. Ghazali said joyfully. I try to call Sana. I mean your Umi, Uma, and let her know just how hard she must be working you for you to have fallen asleep away from home. But even she wasn't home. She smiled. Sudana brought me a glass of water. Yes, Uma is at work tonight. In fact, I have to meet her at... I checked my watch. It's 10.30, brother, Mr. Ghazali called out. I drank the water. What's happening, man? Mr. Ghazali's son Mustafa asked me. Yeah, what up? The younger brother Talil greeted me. Mr. Ghazali, I wanted to have a brief business meeting with you. That's why I came by tonight. I hope I haven't inconvenienced you in your home, I said, my way of apologizing. Don't insult me. You know that you are welcome here anytime. I was so impressed with the way you handle your business, I was hoping we could work together again somehow. Thank you, Aki, I said. It was a way of acknowledging Mr. Ghazali as my brother. If my father were standing right there, he would have scolded me to address Mr. Ghazali as Am, or Uncle, which is what a young man calls any man who is older than himself by more than a few years. Well, good night, gentlemen, Tamara Auntie, Mrs. Ghazali said, and three of her daughters followed her out of the living room area. Sudana didn't. She came over to collect the empty glass from me and looked into my eyes like she wanted to say something. But then she didn't. She turned to leave, then looked back and said, I mentioned to my oob that I saw your wife Ak and me in the Sunday edition of the New York Times, the art and entertainment section. I'm sure that you've seen it already. I just wanted to say that the kimono she was wearing was incredible. Did Uma make it? She asked, her eyes filled with curiosity. No. Akami brought the kimono from Japan, and then she designed the outside herself. You know, she's an artist. Obviously a great one. They only had her picture in there for the entire event at the Museum of Modern Art. I guess she overwhelmed them, Sudana said. Yes. She overwhelms me too, I said naturally, without thinking about hurting Sudana's feelings. But her face didn't reveal any hurt. I was glad. It must be something having a famous wife. I mean, you know Muslim men, and we know that Sudanese men don't prefer to have their wives out in the open, right, Oob? She asked her father, and before he could even respond, she said to me softly, I would have worn the veil for you. It was a bold statement for a Sudanese girl, especially in the presence of her father. More than that, it was a polite offer. Sudana, let the men talk, Mr. Ghazali said, dismissing his daughter. She turned and left obediently without a word of protest, as it should be. Outside, Mr. Ghazali sped his taxi and reversed down his driveway, stopping abruptly right before his fence. He waved me into the front seat. I got in. He got out to open the fence. His sons emerged from the dark corner of the yard to lock the fence back up. So what's going on? Mr. Ghazali asked. I have to make a trip to Japan, I told him, getting right into it. Whoa! Japan! Sounds nice, but very expensive. 
You know, they say it's the third most expensive country to live in in the world. I had a guy in my cab once telling me a slice of fish out there is eight dollars. Eight dollars! They'll slice one fish up ten times. They're selling one medium-sized red snapper for eighty U.S. dollars. Eighty U.S. dollars! If I were living out there, I'd have to turn my whole family vegetarian overnight just trying to make it. He made a sound of disapproval with his teeth that most Sudanese make and understand. My Uma and my young sister Naja will stay in New York. That's what I wanted to discuss. I want to set up car service for them for every morning and every evening while I'm away. I came to you because I need someone I can trust, not just a taxi driver to pick up and drop off. You never told me where you and your family are living, he reminded me. They'll be staying at a Manhattan hotel while I'm away, I said, eluding him. Mr. Ghazali maneuvered around the double parked cars, but had to hit the brakes when he reached a triple parked car. The Impala was in the middle of the street, blocking any passage left, right, or straight. There was no driver seated in the vehicle. I lost a good driver from the Ivory Coast this way, he said, sitting behind the parked car without honking or cursing. My driver leaned on his horn on one of these Bronx streets where people parked like they're crazy. Some 16-year-old kid without a driver's license or insurance ran downstairs and shot him dead for blowing the horn too loud. The kid jumps in the car and speeds away, leaving my driver's bloody body behind. A valuable life lost for no reason. This is what I've been trying to say to you, young brother. You don't need to explain to me what you want out of life or how you want your mother and sister treated. We are Muslim. We are Sudanese. We both understand and want the same exact things. It's these animals out here, he said, pointing to the people lingering on the block. It's them who don't understand or care. They got no God, no boundaries, no limits, no respect for life. Just then, a man dashed out of the building shirtless, jumped in the car that was blocking us, and peeled off. No acknowledgement or apology. Straight New York ghetto style. Mr. Ghazali waited five seconds and then drove on. So you need someone to make sure that your mother and sister are secured. You need a driver who will go inside if he doesn't see them waiting where they're supposed to be and someone who will not pull off before they get inside safely at night. Yes, Aki, I answered, appreciating not having to exchange too many words about a simple but important plan. And the reason they are staying in the hotel instead of with their new friends is? He asked, checking my face and quickly moving his eyes back to the road. I don't want to burden you with my family. I just wanted to hire your car service because I would feel more comfortable knowing and trusting the person who is transporting my mother and sister. I can pay for the whole thing in advance. I don't know exactly how many days I'll be gone, but I'm trying to keep it under one week. Mr. Ghazali pulled over. Get out, he said calmly. His command threw me off for a second. Then I reached for the handle and opened the taxi door. With one foot in the cab and the other on the curb, I pulled out a small stack of bills and peeled off a five to pay him for taking up a brief time in his cab. He didn't move to accept it. I thought maybe it was not enough and that somehow the small amount had insulted him. So quickly I peeled off a ten and extended my arm again. I don't know the story of your life, young brother, but I can see that there are no friends in your world. You say you want someone who you can trust, yet you trust no one. No man can do his time alone on this earth. This is why we have the Muslim Brotherhood. I invited you to our mosque. 
yet you haven't shown your face there at home a prayer. Is there anything that unites you and me other than this paper money? He asked me with a stern stare at the measly ten dollars. I went deep inside my own mind. My father had everything. Land, an estate, money, power, family, and friends. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood met on our property. Men bent in daily prayer at our mosque, whose children attended the madrasa at our estate, whose wives worked and entertained with my mother. But something did go wrong, and it went wrong enough for me to be standing in the streets of the BX and living in the projects of Brooklyn and grinding on American soil, not the rich earth of the Sudan, where I, my mother, and father, and father's father, and father's father's father, and so on, were born. If my father, a brilliant and bold, degreed, rich and successful man, could not win and rely on the trust of men in the end, why should I expect it now? My father is so much better than I am. I don't know, Mr. Ghazali. Holy Quran says that Allah is sufficient. I answered with the only truth that came to mind right then. Yes, and your mother's name is Uma. A powerful name, Uma. That word means the community of Muslim believers. The believers have got to stand together, worship together, protect together, fight together, and eat together. He searched me for a response. I didn't have one. It's only a few days. Your Uma and sister are welcome to stay in our home. My wife already loves your mother and young sister. My daughter Sudana admires you. So of course she loves your mother. It is only you standing on the outside. Let me be a help to you. You know well that my Uma cannot sleep in your home when you have two grown and unmarried sons. And there is also you, Mr. Ghazali. I looked him in the eye. Of course, but there is a separate apartment downstairs. Your mother and my wife were planning to have a woman's business there, remember? Uma can use that apartment. It's well furnished, with a small kitchen, a separate entrance, and a separate key, he told me calmly. I listened, but questioned his eagerness in my own mind. I think my seconds of silence insulted him somehow. Sure you can choose to put your family in a hotel. There, they will be surrounded by kafirs, non-believers, unmarried or married, Untrustworthy either way, he said with a stern sarcasm. How much do you rent it for? Eh? Your basement apartment. Six fifty per month, he said, exasperated, as though he pronounced the first figure that popped up in his head and had never really rented out his basement before. Okay, I'll bring you six fifty tomorrow, plus the transportation fees. I got out and shut his taxi door, leaned in, and handed him now a $20 bill. He took it. I wouldn't be surprised to see you as the Prime Minister of the Sudan one day. So much power, business, and intensity in such a young brother, he said. Good night, I told him before walking away. Chapter 7 It was well after midnight when I carried my seven-year-old sister on my back to our Brooklyn apartment. Uma said, She should really walk on her own two feet. Naja said, But Uma, you two have been now having fun without me. Can I at least get a ride on my brother's back? Out having fun, Uma replied softly in her way. Then she looked at me and said, You see? Naja clenched me tightly with no plans of climbing down before the elevator reached our floor and she was delivered to her bedroom. Uma was right, as she usually is. 
Naja is our protected princess who has no real idea of worry or struggle or stress. I thought that was good. I planned to protect my sister and keep her hidden away from those things that should never be revealed to little girls. In our traditions, a young girl lives under the protection of her father and brothers until she becomes a young woman. Then the father and her brothers will marry her into the protective care of her tried and tested, carefully chosen husband. As I looked into Uma's eyes so striking behind her nikah that shielded and covered everything else, I could see and feel that she was worried. I thought to myself, Uma, don't you worry. If you are uneasy, I will not move one inch from your side. I will stay right here with you. But Uma noticed me noticing her, and she cleared her worries and lowered her gaze. Tuesday, May 6, 1986 We made Fajr prayer together, my mother, sister, and me, followed by a warm and comfortable breakfast. Uma and I did not discuss the details of my Japan trip until after Naja was safely seated in the school bus to Khadija's Islamic School for Girls. Naja waved as the bus eased off. She was so happy this morning because she had her sitter, Miss Marcy, Uma, and me all escort her to the bus. Usually, Uma and I are already on our way to Uma's job and Naja is left in the care of Miss Marcy and walked directly into the care of the teacher who travels with the students on the bus. But today, Uma would not report to work until 4 in the afternoon. She has switched her schedule for this week with a co-worker from the night shift. She and I both agreed that there was more planning and work for us to do than time to do it. She also wanted to complete some products for me to deliver to Uma Design customers before I left for Japan. When you go to see the jewelers again today, you should also select a gift for your father-in-law, Uma said. She slid an old high-quality jewelry box across the table. Why should I? He stole my wife, I answered swiftly yet respectfully. I opened the box. It was a Rolex date just. The hands of the clock were paused in time. The crystal was cracked. I had never seen it before. Your wife is his daughter. Our family has not ever been able to meet and greet him properly. We haven't offered him anything, yet he gave me such a lovely daughter-in-law. You just have to go there and ease his fears. Once he sees you and discovers how respectful you are toward him and sees how much Akemi is in love with you and you with her, his heart will soften toward you. If it does not soften toward you, he will certainly soften his heart for his daughter. Remember that even though we feel sad and insulted and ashamed that Akemi is not with us, he stole her away out of love more than cruelty. I was not focused on feeling any sympathy towards Naoko Nakamura. I was keeping him right where he needed to be in my mind just in case I had to do him something. I slid the box containing the date just in my pocket. Uma, I thought I saw worry in your eyes late last night. You know I won't go anywhere if I see that. I was watching her closely. I was just tired and I was also thinking too much. After you told me on the train about the arrangement with Mr. Ghazali, I wondered if he had asked his wife first if it was okay for me to stay with them while you were away. I didn't give him a chance to speak with her first. I rode in his taxi with him, and we talked it out right there. He was on his way back out to work for the night. I see, Uma said, sounding hesitant. You know the Ghazalis are new friends to our family. It has been good for me because Tamara Auntie doesn't ask me personal questions. It is as though our friendship began from the moment I took her and her sister's and daughter's measurements for their garments for their nephew's wedding. And she and I have moved forward from there without ever looking back or discussing the past. I appreciate her for that very reason. If I go stay over there at her house, it may all very well change. Then come to Japan with me, I said with a smile. I was serious and sincere. She pushed away and hit me on my shoulders as though the idea was ridiculous. We have spent every penny of almost $100,000 on our new house and I love it. 
Now we have minus three pennies left. She laughed. You go on and get your wife, and Naja and I will stay at Mr. Ghazali's. Naja will be excited living in the house with such a big family, and her Arabic will improve, I'm sure. Uma brightened all the way up to reassure me that she was okay. You know, Uma, even though you and Mrs. Ghazali have become friends, I handle this as straight business. It's their house, but it's a separate apartment, separate entrance, separate key, and rent. I know you have made it right for me, and I know their basement apartment is very nice. It is where Tamara Auntie and I plan to have our Sudanese women's groups meetings, so I am sure it will be fine. I stood up from our kitchen table where Uma was seated. I needed to grab my things and head out to the Diamond District. In my room, I stood still thinking. After 20 minutes or so, I began flipping through a short pile of papers I had concerning my wife. In a small notebook that I rocked daily in my right pocket, I jotted down what little information I had on Akemi. The first word I wrote was Kyoto, the place where Akemi was born. The second note to myself was Kyoto's Girls High School, the place the MoMA art exhibit event pamphlet said Akemi attended school. The third note was the address Akemi had given me for her father, Rapungi Hills, Tokyo, Japan. The fourth note was the address that her father had written down for himself on our wedding documents. Ginza, Tokyo, Japan. Those were my clues. I shoved the notebook in my pocket. Reluctantly, I pulled out the letter that Akemi had written to me and had delivered to Cho's, where I worked my weekend job on the exact day that she went missing. She had written it all in kanji. Maybe she had explained herself in those pages or left the name and address of where her father was about to drag her. She knew I could get the letter translated into English the same way that I had arranged for her marriage documents to be translated into Japanese, and the same for a marriage contract. I pushed her letter into my back pocket. I wanted to know what it said, yet I didn't want to know what it said. Either way, I was gonna go get her regardless. In a last minute decision, I grabbed Akemi's diary off my desk, secured my diamonds, and headed out into a blue-gray cloudy day. Chapter 8 By noon, I had sold one of my three three-carat diamonds. Where did you get them? The jeweler asked, eyeing the gem through his loop, which was lodged in his right eye. From Africa, I said, knowing the continent was so huge that my response was the same as not answering him at all. How much would you give me for each of them? I asked him without any eagerness in my voice. We settled on $15,000 for one diamond. He pushed hard for a package deal on all three of the diamonds. He also tried to position his pitch as though he was somehow doing me a favor by buying the gems from me, insinuating that they were stolen and he was relieving me of my illegal goods. I smiled at the slickness of his angle. Glanced around at the arrangements of counters, offering hundreds of African diamonds for sale. I assured him that the three diamonds in the palm of my hand were not the stolen diamonds, and that right now, only one of these precious stones was available for him to purchase. I sold him one, watched his fingers as he counted out my payment in cash, all hundreds. I saw how each pile of bills that added up to $5,000 was a half an inch high. When my stack reached one and a half inches high, I left the Diamond District with my pockets fat and the whole day in front of me. I had the watch repaired and wore it like my father had worn it years ago. I walked into the first travel agency I came up on, Liberty Travel. It was a place plastered with pictures, posters, and postcards featuring discounted getaways around the world. Your destination, please, the receptionist asked. 
Kyoto, Japan, I responded without any real mental picture of the country. I was good at geography, though, and could easily point out the small island on the world map. I was familiar with the country's shape and size, and even the ocean that surrounded it. But that was all. Please have a seat, and our Japan agent will be with you in a moment. When would you like to travel? The Japan expert asked. Right away, I answered. She looked up from her terminal with a twisted smile. Like this afternoon or tomorrow? She said with sarcastic disbelief. How much is the ticket? I asked to keep it business. Are you in the military? She asked me oddly. No. Can I see your passport? She asked like an officer of the law. But I didn't have my Sudanese passport on me. I didn't realize that I needed to present it to the travel agent. It was in Brooklyn, locked in Uma's chest with papers that Uma would say if lost would make each member of our family invisible. You need your passport. This is a big trip, aside from the fact that by ordering the ticket at the last minute, you lose all of the discounts that you could have benefited from if you had come in two weeks to one month prior to your departure date. No one just hops on a plane to a country that's 7,000 miles away without being prepared. If you don't have a passport, you need to go and get one. The passport office is next door to Rockefeller Center. It's open till 6 p.m. today. You're an American citizen, right? She asked. Her question jarred me. I had recently gotten my American citizenship papers, but I am 100% Sudanese. On second thought, I would have to get an American passport now that my citizenship was official. How long does it take to get the passport? I asked her. Six weeks, she said grimly. I sat frozen in my chair, but was rapidly defrosting as the heat began to rise up from my feet, climbing and spreading into my chest. Well, you don't need a passport to buy the ticket from me. We asked for it because your airline ticket must show the exact name that appears on the passport. But you will need the passport to travel outside of the United States. If you purchase an airline ticket from me right now, you can take the ticket plus an express fee over to the passport office and receive your passport in three days' time. But the plane ticket is going to be expensive, she warned. I eased back in my seat. That's more like it, I thought to myself. I was relieved that the conversation looped back around to Cash being able to make sh** move. That's what I was accustomed to. Let's do it, I told her and gave her my exact name as it appeared on my American citizenship papers. Date of departure? She asked again. Friday, in three days when I'll have my passport, I answered. I recommend that you fly the following day, on Saturday, just in case anything goes wrong. Give yourself 24 hours to fix it. Once I issue this ticket, you will not be able to change your departure date or time, she said. But you can change your return date and time for a fee. I didn't know it then, but her recommendation would change my life. I thought about it quickly. I had a basketball game coming up this Friday night with the black team of the Hustlers League. I had been working hard all spring for our team to win the league and for me to get that big money prize that would put me and Uma in a more secure financial space with our business, Uma Designs. I thought about it further. Every minute and every day that I delayed or that passed me by put too much distance between me and my wife and too much opportunity for anyone who was trying to. Okay then, I'll leave on Saturday, May 10th, and return on the following Saturday, May 17th. One week, please. Are you sure? It's $200 if you change the return date. One week in Japan is not a long time. She cautioned. One week, I confirmed. Would you like to fly American Airlines or Japan Airlines? J-A-L, I answered. Soon she was asking, How would you like to pay for your ticket? MasterCard, Visa, or American Express? Cash. Suddenly I saw how important it was to have a credit card. Up until now, Uma and I had done good business without one for seven years living in the United States. Now the agent accepted cash for my airline ticket and the rail pass that she recommended for the Shinkansen bullet train. She said the rail pass would allow me to pay one fare but use the bullet train all week 
for rapid travel back and forth between Tokyo and Kyoto. She insisted, however, that I needed to give her my credit card for her to secure my hotel reservation. She assured me that these were peak travel months for Japan and I will be looking for trouble without booking accommodations. Fact was, I didn't have one to give her and neither did Uma. After one hour in the travel agency, I had my tickets in my hand and my head filled with lessons learned. I became real clear that even though I had traveled internationally before, I had been a child back then. All my arrangements had been made by my father. I had never had the challenge of considering the details. Now I had to listen carefully and absorb each piece of info completely. I had to watch more closely, read documents more carefully, and make decisions with confidence, although I might not be 100% certain. The travel agent had been pushy and sarcastic. She proved that even if you don't know a person or even like them one bit, you can still learn something from them to assist you in life. She booked a hostel for me and took the time to teach me the difference between a hotel and a hostel. A hostel can be found in almost every country in the world. It's like a hotel, but it's not. It's housing reserved for traveling students. It's like a dormitory where you will stay alongside other students from all over. It's not nearly as luxurious as any three- or four-star hotel. It doesn't offer the same facility or services, but there will be a bed in either a private room or with a roommate. The cheapest hostels give you a bed in a large room where there are several beds and other students staying there as well. If you were planning a longer stay, I could make sure that you got into a hostel that has a shared kitchen with a full stove and refrigerator, and even a shared living room area. The best thing about a hostel, though, is that because it's reserved for students, it's cheap. There are some as low as $5 for a night. I looked at her skeptically. She added, But there might not be a television. Can you live without a television? I booked a private room in a hostel called Shinjuku Uchi, located in the part of Tokyo called Shinjuku. I could pay in cash once I arrived there, and all I needed to check in was my passport and any student identification card. It was $20 per night, and down the street from the Shinjuku station, where the agent told me there was a train going anywhere in the country. Rushing, I dashed into the passport office to get the application and requirements. I was glad I shot by there. They were asking for all types of documentation. Now that I knew the deal, I wouldn't give them any chances to delay my passport for any reason. I planned to return there in the morning and be the first person to get my joint processed. Precise Translations was located downstairs in the same building as the passport agency. I stood outside their door, gripping Akemi's diary and debating with myself. Nine minutes later, I submitted the letter that Akemi wrote to me in Japanese for translation into English. This was a new translation company for me. The one I had used for everything else involving Akemi and me was on the third floor. I decided not to return to the same company because maybe they already had too much information on me and my young wife. Now, I wanted to believe that these translators remained neutral, minded their business, and just interpreted the words on the paper. What if they didn't? What if the battle between me and my wife's father thickened? I didn't want to be using the translator and paying for the translations that might later be used as evidence against me. I held out her diary, but then decided against requesting a translation of it. Although it might contain all the information I needed, it seemed too personal. I thought about Uma and how private she was about her journal and papers and pocketbook. The same respect I will give to Uma, I should give to my wife, I decided. At my bank, where Uma's account was and the teller knew me from placing our deposits regularly, I deposited $3,000 of the cash I was holding into Uma's bank account. I also purchased $1,000 worth of American Express traveler's checks for my use. The travel agent had recommended this also. And when I checked her reaction when I first tried to book a hotel room with cash, 
I knew that if I had a few traveler's checks, certain establishments would consider me more legitimate than if I was moving around only with a pocket stuffed with dough. At the Travelex money exchange, I stood on a short line checking out the long list of countries and the names of the money they used. The world was a lot bigger than the American dollar. There was the Sudanese dinar, the Chinese yuan, the German mark, the Indian rupee, the South African rand, the English pound, and the Japanese yen. I pushed 1,000 American dollars through the small curved slot at the bottom of the thick bulletproof glass. The teller turned it into Japanese yen. After being used to handling American green dollars, which were all the same color, shape, and size no matter the amounts, the Japanese yen looked like play money. There were pictures of Japanese men on each bill, some bills tan, some colored blue. The only similarity to American money was that it was all plastered with old men wearing weird hairstyles that I would never rock. They were looking real grim. Chapter 9 Back in Brooklyn, I bounced by and picked up Naja. We then escorted Uma to her job by 4 p.m. sharp. Where are we going now? Naja asked, her big brown eyes exploring mine. You'll see, was all I offered. Down on Fulton Street, right next to the Alby Square Mall, I stopped at an outdoor photo booth. I needed to take two passport-sized photos. I want to get in the picture with you, Naja said. I pulled back the curtain, let her slide in first, then sat down beside her. It's going to take three shots real fast, so quick, get ready, I told her and dropped in my coins. She was real excited. She pushed her little face up toward the glass that hid the camera. Then she pulled it back. The light flashed three times. I opened the curtain and then stood up. That's it, I told her, letting her climb out. Well, where are the pictures? Stand right there. They'll drop down in a few seconds. What are you doing now? She asked. I gotta take some photos on my own. Why? But instead of answering her, I closed the curtain and held her little hand as she stood on the opposite side. The camera snapped three more photos of just me alone. I opened the curtain. Naja had the first set of pictures in her hand. She stood staring at them. Do you think I look pretty? Naja asked. Of course, I told her. For real? Or are you just saying that? She questioned with a serious face. No. I'm just saying that, I teased her. Your pictures look better. You look real cool, Naja said to me. Don't put your fingerprints on the pictures. Just hold them on the sides like this. Why? She asked, but then she held them the right way. At the pizza shop, I brought Naja a slice and a salad. Do you think we're weird because we don't eat at McDonald's? She asked before biting down on an olive. No. This girl in my class said that everybody normal eats McDonald's. She said that Muslims can eat McDonald's too. People can do whatever they want to, I answered Naja carefully. But in our family, we don't worry about what everyone else thinks is normal. We do what we believe is best. So follow Uma, no matter what your friends say. Okay. She smiled, contented. I phoned Mr. Ghazali from downtown Brooklyn, but his son, Mustafa Salim, answered the phone. After extending my greetings, I told him, I was calling to get your father's permission to stop by your house tonight at 10. I need to hand him something. No problem with me, he said, using the Sudanese term for cousin. I'll relay your message, but come on by. I'm sure it's okay with father. Feeling decent about how my day was flowing and about accomplishing sh** one by one, I headed to Chinatown to do a face-to-face -face with Cho, the owner of the Chinatown fish market where I worked on Fridays and Saturdays. He was a Chinaman who had reluctantly broken his regular pattern of doing things and given me a job a year ago. In almost 52 weekends, I had never missed a workday or even ever arrived late. Whenever he needed me to do overtime, 
I did it, no problem. So I planned to do the honorable thing and give him a heads up about my travel plans, which would cause me to miss three of Cho's busiest work days. Naja's little hand was moist in the warm spring air. I held on to it, though, not wanting her to get swept away as Chinatown got invaded by the NY after-work crowd looking for some fresh goods to prepare for dinner. You don't have to hold my hand. I won't get lost, she said as her little feet had to double step to keep up with my swift pace. Oh, yeah, I said, still holding on to her. If we got separated, I could find you easily. Your sneakers are cleaner than everyone else's and your laces are so cool. How come my sneakers are dirty? How come when you walk around all day, your sneakers never get dirty? She asked, looking up at me. I just smiled. But I did decide I would buy her a new pair of kicks. We dipped into a sneaker store. She wanted to pick. When she came back with some polka dot skips, I chose for her instead. The Daquan and me wouldn't let it slide. He had been the 5%er, fashion regulator, gun dealer, fight promoter, and big brother to his five blood brothers and for my whole Brooklyn block before he got knocked. Cho and his nephew Chow were in a rhythm, satisfying the customers and knocking them off the line one by one. I waited till the small crowd cleared. What do you do here on a weekday? Cho questioned. I came to give you a heads up. This weekend I'm going to work Friday like regular, but I have to take off all Saturday the 10th and the following weekend the 16th and the 17th. There was a long pause between us. Cho looked like he was thinking real hard about my simple and clear request. Just then, I saw Sachi, Akemi's young cousin, walk up and sit down beside Naja outside Cho's door. I'm letting you know now to give you enough time to get someone to fill in for me, okay? I asked, but I was definite. Cho folded his arms across his chest. You chase Japanese girl to the end of the earth! Since I don't discuss my wife with other men, I didn't answer Cho. I knew that he knew that my letting him know was a courtesy, not a request. I'll see you on Friday morning, Cho. Don't count me out. I'll be here for sure, I reassured him. He mumbled something back at me, some sentences spoken in Chinese, so I figured he must be talking to himself. Eight-year young Sachi jumped off the steps and put her hands right on her hips, where she liked to keep them. She was calling me by the name that Akemi called me. Mayonaka, meaning midnight in Japanese. Naja followed behind her. Before the little Japanese girl could start dropping her word bombs, her father, who was also my wife's uncle, appeared outside their family store door, which was four doors down from Cho's on the same side of the block. Oh, you better go, you know. Here comes your father. Naja warned Sachi. But the little girl only removed one hand from her hip and said through a half smile, He's only scary for you guys. My father's very nice to me. She turned on her toes to take off and I slowed her down. We'll walk over with you, I said. She and Naja began skipping slowly. Naja got her first scuff mark on her new ACGs. Konbanwa, Uncle Nakamura, I said, using the Japanese language intentionally. Good evening, he answered in English dryly and for his own reasons too. How's it going? How's business? I asked, even though I had just seen him on Sunday when I was searching for Akemi. I suspected that he may even call the cops on me for loitering outside of his store door, but really for loving and marrying his niece. Fine, he responded with one word only. See you next time, Sachi, Naja said. Good night, I said. I purposely wanted to appear to be calm and pleasant in this thought battle that I was having with the Japanese men in my wife's family. No reason to tip them off that I was headed over to take back what was mine. Inside, I was boiling once again. I could tell from Uncle's posture that they thought they had won. 
It was as though they believed that they lived in the first world and I was stuck in the third or fourth or fifth or sixth world that somehow I wouldn't be able to figure out how to cross the Pacific Ocean beyond Alaska and over the Siberian mountains to get my wife. In a short time, they will discover that they were wrong. What did Sachi say to you? I asked Naja. First, she asked me what I was doing over here. Then she showed me the string that she had in her pocket and how she could twist it into a bunch of different shapes. Then she asked me if I missed Akimi and if we had heard from her. What did you tell her? What could I tell her? I didn't know anything. Naja said with her arms raised halfway and palms facing up. Are you sure you didn't say anything extra? I checked. I just told her that I do miss Akimi and that I am sure she will come back real soon. Then Naja shifted her eyes away from me. And I pushed. And why? She said softly, but understanding the intensity in me. Sachi said that Akimi is never coming back. The words of my seven years young sister hit me in the chest like powerful kicks. But I told Sachi that she really doesn't know that for sure. Naja said confidently. And I continued. Sachi said that her father told her that Akimi's father saved Akimi from ruining her life. My jaw tightened. I stood still on the busy block holding my sister's hand, thinking. That's it? That's all Sachi said? That's it. That's all Sachi said. Oh, wait a minute. I left one thing out. Earlier she told me that her real name is Sachiko, but that she lets people she likes call her Sachi for short. She says Sachiko means happiness. But the mean thing she told me about you ruining Akami's life, she said that last. Then you came outside. Chapter 10 Me and Chris dipped into our funds and bought you a wedding present. We could have got you something before if you would have let us know you was getting married, Amir said. We were in the dojo locker room, suiting up in our dojis. Me, Amir, and Chris, my two best friends. They were weeks late with their gift, but it was cool. Truth is, I wasn't expecting anything at all. So since the money came from our car fund, that means that I paid for a third of my wedding gift, I said, kidding them about the money that we all three had saved up over our seven-year friendship. True, true, Chris smiled. But brother, that's not the point, Chris added. So where is it? I asked, standing with my arms extended doubtfully. It's at Amir's place, Chris said. I turned toward Amir and asked him, Is this gift something that you used first? Because if you already used it, you can keep it. Y'all know I don't like leftovers. I slammed my locker shut, laughing. That's cold, Amir answered. Maybe I should use it first. We hit the floor, taking up our positions. Naja shrank herself into a corner beneath the large, antique gray metal fan, reading the new book I had just bought her. During the second dojo hour, Sensei called out for sparring. Although he always chose random partners, he tried to avoid putting me, Chris, and Amir up against one another. He put me against a muscular heavyweight instead, an old dude, about 29 or so. It wasn't a conscious choice for me to place the face of Akemi's rude-ass uncle over the face of my sparring partner. Akemi is never coming back. Akemi is never coming back. Akemi is never coming back. I kept hearing that one sentence. I must have heard it too much or too loud in my mind. I landed a blow to my opponent that shifted his jaw and cracked his nose. It was only a slow stream of blood running from his nose, over his lips, and onto his teeth that brought my mind back into focus and into the dojo. My bad man, I said. Sensei stood staring. It didn't move me. 
We are warriors and some blood gotta spill sometimes. This was not the first time someone caught a bad one in now a ninjutsu dojo. Later, outside the dojo, me, Amir, and Chris conspired in the warm night weather. What's up for tonight? I asked them. Nothing, man. You brought your kid's sister. I wanted you to come through the east tonight, Amir said, referring to East New York. Word. Chris, you headed to the east? I asked. Punishment, remember? I'm still on punishment. As we all laughed, Chris's father, Reverend Broadman, rolled up, pushing the caddy and snatched Chris up. How about tomorrow night? I could come through after ball practice, but it'll be late, I told Amir. Nah, then come through in the afternoon after I get back from school around 4.30. It'll be safer for you then. Amir glanced down at my father's watch, then smiled. You know how to eat? Yeah, you got me. I gave him a pound. I'll check you tomorrow, I said as I walked away. I wouldn't want none of them boys around my way to steal your wedding gift from you. Especially after you paid for it and I used it first, Amir said with a laugh. He got that one off on me. Later, I told him and grabbed my sister's hand and kept it moving. Is it wrong if I think that your friend is handsome? Naja asked me as we rode on the train after being unusually silent the whole time. What do you mean? I said, shocked and having nothing else to say. You know, like he gives a girl a special feeling when she looks at him. Amir does. She said quietly. Don't look at him then. That's why the Quran teaches us to lower our gaze. When you see boys, don't stare at them. Don't talk to them. Don't let them look into your eyes, and you don't look into theirs either. Don't do anything. I scolded her, feeling off guard. It's only the first time I felt that, she said softly. And I don't see boys or stare at them either. I go to an all-girls school, remember? Maybe I only noticed them because you brought me here again. Sorry. She apologized. I'm sorry, too. I hugged my sister with one arm. I won't bring you there no more. And you let your first time feeling be your last time feeling until... Uh, until when? She asked. Until it's time for you to marry. Who knows when that is? She said below her breath. Mountain, and I want to give a special shout out to Ralph Anthony Garcia of the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Make sure y'all go to the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Check out his channel. Check out his series, Ralph Reads. Give it a like. Subscribe to his channel. And um, check out what he got to offer. Some really good stuff up there. This is Mike Mountain, and this message is approved by me. You are now experiencing the Renpet Phenomenon, an Afrofuturistic book series. Afrofuturism is the cure to sci fi. Download now and experience melanin biotechnology. Bahalapantis of magnetizing manly musk hinted with a splash of light 